Hello and welcome to the TI Precision Labs covering decoupling capacitors. This is part of a larger series on PCB layout for good EMC. The series is specifically intended to cover mixed signal designs where the digital signals are less than 100 MHz and the clock rise times are greater than 1 nanosecond. This video looks at factors impacting the impedance of decoupling networks such as PCB trace length, via selection, and capacitor parasitics. The video also covers how current flows relative to the decoupling network and associated power and ground planes. Let's start by looking at the decoupling network from a transient and AC impedance perspective. One way to understand how decoupling works is to think of the decoupling network using a transient analysis. The decoupling network has bulk and local decoupling capacitors. Local decoupling capacitors provide high frequency transient current for device power supplies as needed. The instantaneous supply currents on digital circuits and switching analog circuits can be quite high. To provide this transient current, the path connecting the local decoupling capacitor to the power and ground pin of a device needs to have the lowest possible inductance. The local decoupling will provide short transients and the bulk decoupling is a larger capacitor that helps recharge the local decoupling in between transients. Generally, one bulk decoupling capacitor can supply many devices and is placed at the power supply entry for the board. Normally, the bulk decoupling capacitance is sized at least 10 times the sum of all the local decoupling capacitors. A commonly used bulk decoupling capacitance is 10 microfarads and a common local decoupling is 0.1 microfarads or 1 microfarad. The inductance between the power source and the bulk decoupling is generally higher than the inductance between the bulk capacitor and the devices. And the inductance between the local decoupling and the device is the lowest. By providing the high frequency transient current, the local decoupling minimizes the variation in the local device's power supply voltage. Furthermore, the local decoupling prevents the transient current demand from disrupting the power supply bus and other devices. A different way of looking at decoupling is to consider the AC impedance seen by the device power supply terminals. Ideally, this impedance would be high at DC and low at high frequencies to effectively short out power supply transients. From a practical perspective, the impedance of the decoupling network will decrease to low levels at high frequency, then start to increase again from the parasitic inductance. The process of optimizing decoupling is to minimize this parasitic inductance. Also, some decoupling impedance networks will have multiple resonant peaks that could introduce noise problems. We'll look at this in detail. To understand decoupling, it is important to understand a practical model for a capacitor. An ideal capacitor would have capacitive reactants that would always decrease at higher frequencies. A real-world capacitor has parasitic resistance called ESR and parasitic inductance called ESL. The impedance of a practical capacitor will decrease until it reaches the ESR limit, then will begin to increase because of ESL. The example shown here is a typical X7R capacitor which is frequently used for decoupling. More sophisticated models are generally provided by the capacitor manufacturer. One commonly used decoupling method is to use multiple different values in parallel for decoupling. For example, a 100 nanofarad and a 1 nanofarad may be used in parallel. The idea is that the smaller capacitor will have a lower ESL and will provide a lower impedance at high frequencies. The idea was probably correct years ago when through-hole components were popular, but modern surface mount capacitors have similar ESL for different capacitance values. For example, the ESL for a 25 volt 0603 X7R capacitor is relatively the same for a 100 picofarad, 1000 picofarad, and 10,000 picofarad capacitor. For the example part numbers in the slide, the ESL was about 200 picohenries for all the different capacitors. Using the outdated approach of putting different capacitors in parallel can actually cause problems. In the circuit above, a 1 nanofarad and a 100 nanofarad capacitor are placed in parallel. 
If you look at the impedance curve for each capacitor, you can see that the combined curves will create a resonant peak at about 200 MHz. This resonant peak can cause noise to peak at this frequency on the power supply rail. <clears throat> Thus, in general, it is best to use the same value and type of decoupling for all devices on the power supply rail to avoid resonance. Finally, using multiple capacitors when one is sufficient wastes board space and adds cost. This slide shows the preferred method of using the same value of decoupling across the supply rail. Note that the impedance of equal capacitors will be divided by the number of capacitors, so in this example the total impedance is divided by 5. Also note that this example doesn't have any strange resonant peaks from the different values of capacitors. This slide shows decoupling from a practical perspective. Note that the capacitor traces and via all have inductance. In most designs, the ground and power will be on an internal plane, so the capacitor is connected to power and ground using vias. The capacitor is then connected to the device with a short, thick trace. To minimize the inductance of any via connected to ground, it is useful to have a thin dielectric between the signal layer and ground. Also, using multiple vias will reduce the inductance further. One question you may ask is how does the inductance of the via and trace compare to the ESL of the decoupling capacitor? This chart shows the inductance for 12 mil through 20 mil via. The inductance is shown for a thin 9 mil dielectric and a thick 62 mil dielectric. For a 12 mil via, the inductance is more than 10 times greater for the thick dielectric. Thus, the dielectric thickness or height of the via has a significant impact on its inductance. Comparing a 12 mil via to a 20 mil via, you don't see a very large improvement for the large via. Rather than using a large via, it is much better to use parallel vias as the inductance will divide by the number of via. This slide shows the trace inductance versus width, length, and dielectric thickness. In this case, doubling the width cuts the inductance in half. Likewise, reducing the length will also proportionately reduce the inductance. Reducing the dielectric thickness will also reduce inductance, but not substantially. The lengths and widths given in the table are typical for what is connected to decoupling capacitors. The typical ESL of a decoupling capacitor is on the order of 200 nanohenries, so the table shows that the trace inductance can easily be a dominant factor. The slide shows three example layouts. The first layout uses a two-layer board. The two-layer board has a thick 62 mil dielectric, so any via will have a lot of inductance. Furthermore, the trace connecting between the capacitor and DVDD is long and thin. Notice that the parasitic inductances from the trace and via are large compared to the capacitor's ESL. The second example uses a four-layer board. This helps minimize the via and trace inductance. The last example uses shorter traces and multiple via. In this case, the trace and via impedances are now more in line with the ESL of the capacitor. One of the assertions made throughout this presentation is that return current will flow on the plane adjacent to the signal trace regardless if this plane is a power plane or a ground plane. This seems counterintuitive when you think about a traditional circuit with a signal source, load, and ground. In the next few slides we will see how decoupling and return currents flow and see how the PCB stackup impacts the current flow. First let's look at how return current flows in the signal trace that's directly adjacent to the ground plane. In this case, the signal has a distributed parasitic capacitance with the ground plane. When the gate transitions its logic state, the parasitic capacitances will need to be charged or discharged depending on the direction of the logic transition. Before the gate makes a low to high transition, the parasitic capacitances are all discharged to zero volts initially. At the time of the transition, the top transistor is turned on and the bottom one is turned off. 
At this time, the parasitic capacitors will charge to DVDD. Note that the current is drawn from the decoupling capacitor to supply this sharp transient current. Before a high to low transition, the parasitic capacitors are initially charged to DVDD and will discharge through the bottom transistor. Note at this time that the decoupling capacitor and power supply do not provide any current. Finally, note that for both transitions, the return current flows through the ground plane for this configuration. Now let's look at the case where our power plane is beneath the signal trace. In this case, the parasitic capacitance connects from the signal trace to the power plane. Again, transitioning the logic output of the gate will cause this parasitic to charge and discharge. When transitioning from low to high, the parasitic capacitors are initially charged to DVDD and need to discharge to zero volts. This discharge happens when the top transistor turns on. Note that the decoupling capacitor and power supply do not provide any current at this time. When transitioning from a high to low, the capacitor will need to be charged from zero volts to DVDD. In this case, the decoupling capacitor and DVDD supply will provide the current needed to charge the parasitic capacitance. Notice for this example, the return current flows in the power plane. The key points of the last two slides is to show that the decoupling only provides current on one of the logic transitions, and also to show how return current can flow through a power plane. Now let's look at how much current is drawn during the logic transition. The schematic shown here shows the current flow for a low to high transition where the signal trace is above an adjacent ground plane. The CMOS gate needs to provide current to charge up the parasitic capacitors connected from the signal trace to ground. The amount of current required relates to the size of the parasitic capacitor. The size of the capacitor relates to the PCB trace dimensions. Long traces will have large parasitic capacitances. A typical trace capacitance for a medium trace is 10 picofarads. For a 5 nanosecond rise time, the parasitic capacitance will need to be fully charged in the 5 nanoseconds. Current is defined as the change in charge over time, and the charge is defined as C times V. So the average current is C times V over time. For this example, 10 picofarads times 5 volts divided by 5 nanoseconds gives an average current of 10 milliamps during the transient event. The peak current can be estimated as 2 times the average current by assuming the transient has the wave shape of an isosceles triangle. In this case, the peak current is approximately 20 milliamps. The overall average current during the period of the square wave can be determined by dividing the charge by the entire period of the square wave. In this case, the waveform period is 20 nanoseconds and the average current across the period is calculated as 3 milliamps. For proper decoupling, consider that the 3 milliamp average current is provided by the bulk capacitor over the 20 nanosecond period and the 20 milliamp peak current is provided by the local decoupling during the 5 nanosecond transient. Note that doing the same calculation for a 2 nanosecond rise time causes the peak current to increase to 50 milliamps, but the average current in the period is still 3 milliamps. This slide reiterates that the large rapid transient current is provided by the local decoupling. Proper layout with wide traces and multiple via provide a low inductance connection between the local decoupling and the device power supply. Transients happen over a short time period of a few nanoseconds. The average current to recharge the local decoupling happens over a much longer time. The low frequency average current is provided by the bulk capacitance and power supply. Since the frequency of the average current is much lower than the transient current, the power supply connection may have more inductance than the local decoupling path. That concludes this video. Thank you for watching. Please try the quiz to check your understanding of this video's content. Question 1. True or false? Using a large and small value decoupling capacitor is a good way to improve decoupling because the small value decoupling capacitor will be optimal for high frequency. 
For example, connecting a 0.1 microfarad and a 0.001 microfarad capacitor in parallel is a good combination for better high-frequency decoupling. The correct answer is B, false. Most modern ceramic capacitors with similar package size will have similar ESL. In the past, lower value capacitors would have a correspondingly low ESL. So using low value capacitors for high frequency decoupling was a common practice. However, the ESL on modern surface mount ceramic capacitors is no longer closely connected to the capacitive value. Furthermore, the combination of two different capacitors in parallel can have a combined impedance with a resonant peak which can increase noise at that frequency. Question 2. True or false? For low inductance, it is better to place multiple small vias than one large one. For example, two 12 mil via would have a lower inductance than one 20 mil via. The correct answer is A, true. For a 62 mil board thickness, the inductance of a 12 mil via is 1.27 nanohenries, and the inductance of a 20 mil via is 1.11 nanohenries. Placing two 12 mil via in parallel cuts the inductance in half from 1.27 nanohenries to 0.64 nanohenries. Question 3, true or false? The thickness of the dielectric between the decoupling capacitor and the ground plane will impact the decoupling effectiveness. The correct answer is A, true. A thin board means that the via length is short and low inductance. This will reduce the impedance of the decoupling network and make it more effective. Question 4. True or false? For the layout below, when the signal is being transmitted from the CMOS output to the input, the return current will flow in the ground plane. The correct answer is B. False. The return current will always flow in the plane adjacent to the trace. In this example, the power plane is adjacent to the signal trace, so the return current will flow in the power plane. That's all for today's video. Thanks for watching.